Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated, truly, truly is. Before we get started, let me give you my usual disclaimer. This video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions. Next, if you have not liked, subscribed, or commented yet, please consider doing so. It really helps me out and I really, really appreciate it. Okay, before we start, trigger warning, major, major, major trigger warning. There's heavy talk about bullying and teen unaliving. So please take that into consideration before deciding to move forward with this video. So I'm sure the vast majority of you guys know what catfishing is. But for those of you that don't, it's defined as the process of luring someone into a relationship by means of a fictional online persona. There's also this thing called sextortion, which kind of piggybacks off of catfishing. And this is defined as the practice of extorting money or sexual favors from somebody by threatening to reveal evidence of their sexual activity. I'll be honest with you guys. I went back and forth quite a bit trying to decide if I wanted to cover such a heavy topic that not only involved unaliving, which I've have personally experienced, but it also involved young children and I'm not really a fan of covering stories about children. It's a very difficult topic for me. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that as a mother of a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old, I need to educate myself on this topic, as well as bringing it to other parents who may not be aware that this is happening to our children at such an alarming rate. Okay, I'm done babbling now. I know that my babbling and pausing bothers some people. You should let me know in the comments, but I'm done. Let's start. 15-year-old Riley Bassford was born on June 2nd, 2005 to parents Mary and Darren Bassford. He was a sophomore at Post Dam Central School in Postum, New York. The 15-year-old loved to fish and hunt. He played lacrosse and football and had a love for machines. Right before his death, he got his first job, saved up all his money, and purchased a snowmobile to ride around his family's farm. March 30th, 2021, Riley signs up for Facebook. Almost immediately after getting a Facebook account, he gets a message from a beautiful female college student who says her name is Megan. She was able to convince this teen to send her explicit pictures of himself. Then almost immediately after sending the pictures, Riley discovers that he's not talking to a beautiful college girl. He's talking to a catfish. The person behind the computer told Riley that he needed to send him $3,500 or his pictures were going to be put all over social media. The threat started at noon, which was only a few hours after he signed up for Facebook. And this is all happening at his father's house. Then just two hours after the blackmail started, Riley went up to his room and he himself. His father says that Riley just lost his mind from fear and embarrassment. He was scared because the people kept hounding him. His mother said that she wants her son's story out there so that parents can prevent this from happening to their children. Eighteen-year-old Shylin Dixon was born on December 5th, 2002 in Ogdensburg, New York, to parents Holly and Charles. She enjoyed playing basketball, farming, horseback riding, animals, and children. She loved helping people and participating in her school's musicals. In 2021, she was a junior at Hoovelton High School. She was full of life, loved being with her friends, and loved hanging out in trees. But 
two years prior to this, at just 16 years old, Shylin was talked into sending nude photos of herself to two grown men in Pakistan that she met online who were posing as teens. For the next two years, they would blackmail and harass Shylin. They threatened to post the photos of Shylin for a period of time before finally following through with their threats. March 3rd, 2021, the harassment had become just too much for her and she made the heartbreaking decision to take her life. In a note that she left behind, Shylin wrote that she made a mistake and that she was sorry but she couldn't do it anymore. An investigation was conducted after her death and it revealed that the Facebook profile originated in Pakistan. The FBI were able to work with authorities in Pakistan, which led to the arrest of two men, Muhammad Arslan Saeed and Kamal Anwar. 15-year-old Amanda Todd was born November 27, 1996 in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, to parents Norm and Carol Todd. Amanda was described by her mother as fire on wheels. She was very spirited and very active. She loved to sing. She loved art, figure skating, gymnastics, and cheerleading. In 2009, Amanda was in the seventh grade and had just moved in with her father. In a YouTube video that the team posted on September 7th, 2012, just one month prior to her death, Amanda, who only speaks with no cards, states that she used video chat to meet new people and enjoyed the compliments that people were giving her about her looks. She would end up meeting a stranger online that would spend over a year trying to convince the seventh grader to show him her bare breasts. Eventually, the stranger talked her into it while on a webcam stream that the person behind the computer screen grabbed and used to blackmail Amanda. He threatened to show the screenshots to her friends unless she gave him a show. The blackmailer knew the names of her friends, her family, her classmates, and even her home address. Then, during the 2010 Christmas break, the Todd family get a knock on their door at 4 o'clock in the morning. It was a police officer, and he was there to inform the family that Amanda's pictures were circulating the internet. She writes about how she began to experience overwhelming anxiety, depression, and panic disorder. Because the blackmailer knew her address, the family decided to move to another home. But instead of this making Amanda feel safer, the new home became a place where she would begin to abuse alcohol and drugs. Things were quiet down for about a year before the blackmailer reappeared with another Facebook page that had Amanda's photo as the profile picture. The person then began messaging Amanda's classmates at her new school, which led to her being teased and bullied. She writes about how she would cry herself to sleep every single night and had lost all the new respect that she had been able to gain from people. She once again had no friends and would have to sit alone at lunch. It was at this point that Amanda began cutting. Her family decided it was best to pull her from this school and enroll her into a new one. She says that things got better even though she would still eat lunch alone in the library. About a month into being at her new school, Amanda gets a message from an old guy friend of hers. The two begin texting back and forth, and he tells her that he likes her, but that he has a girlfriend. At some point, he tells Amanda that his girlfriend is on vacation, and he asks her to come over to his house and hang out. So she does, and the two teens end up sleeping together. About a week later, the girlfriend, the boy, and 15 of her friends show up to Amanda's school. They begin screaming at her in front of the school, and one boy even yells, just hit her already. So, that's what she does. She throws Amanda down to the ground, and she begins punching her repeatedly while others film it. Amanda would lie and say that it was all her fault, and that the whole thing was her idea. 
She says she did this because she thought that this boy really liked her, but he didn't. He only wanted her for sex. She says she got up and went and laid down in a ditch until her dad came and found her. That night, Amanda went home and she drank bleach in an attempt to unalive herself. Luckily, the ambulance is called and she's brought to the hospital and doctors are able to flush it out of her system. After she returns home, she sees messages all over Facebook stating that she deserved it and they hope she was dead. So after this, the family decided to move her in with her mother who lives in a different city and enroll Amanda in yet another school. So now we are six months past the incident and people are still tagging her in pictures of bleach, Clorox, and ditches, telling her that she should try a different bleach this time. Her cutting would become increasingly worse. She would have to be put on antidepressants and she would spend the entire summer secluded from everyone. Then that summer, Amanda would end up overdosing and spending two days in the hospital. September 10th, 2012, she would end up having to spend 10 days in the hospital to treat her severe depression and her cutting. After getting out of the hospital, things go right back to the way they were. Her peers being calling her a psycho and saying that she's in the crazy hospital. October 10th, 2012, at approximately 6 o'clock in the evening, Amanda was found hanging in her home. She had unlocked herself. In January of 2014, after extensive investigation by Facebook, Dutch police arrested a 35-year-old man named Aiden Coben in a case involving multiple victims in the Netherlands, UK, and Canada. Police found spyware that was downloaded onto his computer, chat logs of extortion, numerous images of children, and 5,800 bookmarked names of potential victims. March 16, 2017, he faced 72 charges of SA in the Netherlands involving 39 victims, 34 young women, and 5 men. He was found guilty and sentenced to 10 years and 8 months. August 5, 2022, a jury at the Supreme Court of British Columbia found Coben guilty. And on October 14, 2022, the judge sentenced him to 13 years in prison for the extortion of Amanda and the pictures. He started the Facebook page, in case you're confused. Because even I was confused. <laughs> he, he had the face. He was the one behind the Facebook page. 17-year-old Ryan Last was a straight-A student and a Boy Scout living in San Jose, California. He was set to graduate from high school in May and had plans of attending Washington State University and majoring in agricultural biotechnology. In February, Ryan receives a message from what he thought was a pretty teenage girl. The two begin talking for long periods of time. At some point, the teen sent Ryan a nude picture of herself and then asked for one in return. Ryan agrees and almost immediately, he realizes that he had made a terrible mistake. The person on the other end of the computer began demanding that Ryan send him $5,000 or he would send the photo to all of his family. He told them they didn't have $5,000, so the blackmailers agreed to accept $150, which Ryan took from his college fund. But after receiving the $150, they began demanding more money. Of course they did. The blackmailers would become relentless, and they just wouldn't give up. March 5th, 2022, it all became too much for the team to handle, and he felt as if he had no other choice but to take his own life. His mother says she kissed him goodnight at 10 p.m. And when she did, she had a her happy teenage boy. Then by 2 o'clock in the morning, her son was gone. 
16-year-old Walker Montgomery was born on November 1st, 2006 in Cleveland, Mississippi to parents Brian and Courtney. He attended Starkville Academy where he excelled in academics as well as football. He enjoyed the outdoors, working on the family farm, and bow hunting with his father. November 30th, 2022 was just like any other day. Walker had just gotten his driver's license. He spent the day hunting with his dad, worked on the farm, ate dinner with his family, and prayed with his mother before going to bed. Sometime after midnight on December 1st, 2022, Walker had a conversation with a person on Instagram that was blackmailing him for money. At some point, Walker messaged who he thought was a teen girl wanting to have a sexual encounter with her. The person on the other end of the computer was obviously not a teen girl. They recorded the entire encounter and they were now demanding $1,000 to keep from sending the video to Walker's family and friends. He would spend the next two hours begging this person to stop and telling him that he didn't have any money. When this wasn't working, Walker told the person that he was going to unalive himself. The person on the other end of the computer would respond by telling him, go ahead and do it because his life was over at this point anyway. So at around two o'clock in the morning, that's exactly what he did. The FBI would trace the IP address to Nigeria and they are hopeful that at some point they will be able to make an arrest. Walker's father would later come out to say that he believed his whole life was over. He believed that the video had already been sent to his mother and that that was going to be the first thing that she saw when she woke up. And he just couldn't bear the thought of that. His father goes on to say that the worst part is that it was a real person on the other side of that keyboard and he's the reason that his son is no longer around his son is dead and this person is going about his life like it never happened it's true 14 year old evan mcdaniel was a kind and loving teen who lived in tomble texas he was an avid student and a cub scout he loved playing sports and messing with his sister January 5th, 2021, Evan began getting messages on Instagram from what he thought was a beautiful young girl. That day, he was on his way home from Louisiana after visiting extended family. His parents had a very strict rule that Evan had to hand over his cell phone every single night and that he wasn't allowed to get it back until 1130 the following morning. So... Overnight, Evan's home was getting flooded with messages from a blackmailer that was threatening to send explicit photos to his family if he didn't send money. But because his mother had his phone, Evan was unaware that this was even happening and therefore he wasn't responding to the blackmailers. This made the blackmailers increasingly mad and the messages became more savage as the night went on the following morning january 6 2021 evan wakes up he drinks his coffee he works out he does his schoolwork, and he speaks with his counselor about his school schedule his mother is out running errands and his father is working from home 11 20 in the afternoon evan finally gets his phone back this would be the first time that he would see what has been going on for the past 14 hours. No actual photo or video has ever been found, but there was a picture sent to his sister and to his cousin. And one of the messages read, you might as well take a gun and shoot yourself in the head because your life is over. His mother says that's exactly what he did. He began rummaging through the house for his father's car keys because he knew that his father kept a gun in his car. Well, no, I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess Texas, it's not that, it's not that random, maybe. Why your car, though? You don't lock them up? Why wouldn't you lock that up? You don't lock them up? He got the gun and he, 
himself in the head in the backyard of the family home. When his mother came home, she asked her daughter to go take out the garbage for her. She would be the one that would end up finding her brother's body and scream for her mother. His mother would say that when she saw him lying there, she thought he had fallen off of his bike and hit his head, and as he was walking into the house, he collapsed. That makes sense, because I don't think that any mother's brain would go to that place. Like, your brain would go anywhere else but there. About a month into the investigation, police tell the family about how their son was being blackmailed. Because there were no talks about money on the Instagram account, they believed that the conversation began on a different app and was eventually brought over to Instagram. They would also tell the family that the IP address was tracked back to the Philippines. So getting justice for her son may never come. In April of 2012, police would find and arrest 39-year-old Richard Finkbeiner for running one of the largest cases of online sextortion in the country. Investigators would find thousands of sexually explicit video clips of teen boys. He would talk the teens into performing sex acts through webcams and record it. After his arrest, Finkbeiner would end up admitting everything to police, telling them that he has a minimum of 100 victims. He would find the teens on social media. He would contact them and threaten to make them into gay porn stars if they didn't comply with his demands. He allegedly talked to four... He allegedly talked to two... 14 year old boys one from michigan and the other from maryland he talked them into performing explicit sexual acts while on video chat with him they would also find one of the victims begging him to stop to which he replied quote i won't get caught i'm a hacker i covered my tracks end quote thankfully both boys eventually told their parents what had been going on and the parents called police. If not, who even knows how many more victims they he would have had. He was initially arrested and charged for the two 14-year-old boys, but as the investigation continued, he received more and more charges. His victims ranged in age from 12 to 16 years old and lived in nine different states. Indiana, West Virginia, Iowa, Wisconsin, Ohio, New York, Michigan, Illinois, and Colorado. In June of 2012, Finkbeiner was sentenced to 40 years in prison and fined $70,000. 50-year-old David... 50-year-old David Ernest Otto of Portland, Oregon would be tracked down and arrested uh, after the mother of one of his victims calls police. November 20th, 2016, the mother of a 15-year-old girl found Instagram messages between her daughter and Otto. She had been engaging in highly sexual conversations with him and sending him nude pictures of herself. An investigation into the IP address would lead police to Otto's home. With the search warrant in hand, police seized all of Otto's digital devices. They would end up finding an additional seven more girls that range in age from 13 to 17 and were found on multiple social media platforms. Otto would plead guilty to one count and receive 15 years in federal prison. Do I think that's fair? No, I don't. I absolutely don't. Not even a little bit. I think it's actually a disgrace of a sentence considering there were a minimum of eight victims. Predators will use gaming apps, social media apps, dating apps, and video chat apps to find their victims. 
teens. They typically target young teens because their brains are not fully developed yet and it's easiest to manipulate them. Once they gain the victim's trust, usually by using a fake profile, they will begin to coerce their victims into sending videos and pictures. Once they have what they need, the blackmail begins and will continue until the victim either tells an adult or has a tragic ending. Guys, if you have young children, I implore you to have a conversation with them. I even had a conversation with my daughter and even though she assured me that she would never ever do something like this, I reminded her that if she did, she could come to me, she could tell me, and I promised her that I would not be mad at her or disappointed in her whatsoever. If you have teens, I beg you to do the same. Because... (laughs) The other option is horrible. It is tragic. Let them know that they can come to you. Let them know that they could talk to you and let them know that you will not be mad or ashamed or anything else. You will just fix it and you will make it right. And they may be ashamed for a little bit, but it will go away and everything will be fine. Please do that for me, please. Guys, if you are still here, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and I appreciate you so, so, so very much. If you've heard about this, let me know. If you have teenagers and you've experienced anything like this, leave and you feel like you want to leave your stories in the comments. You never know who can read your comments and it may help somebody. It may give somebody an idea. You never know. But until next time, stay safe out there.